Between Two Fires, Part 3. For they had been so long alone in the lower depths, the fallen had made their own kingdom there and declared themselves lords of that place. From the first days of their captivity, they had ignited false stars on the roof of hell to make a mockery of what was above. They had dug dead rivers and gouged seas that smoked and blistered. They had raised cruel hills. They had set forests of iron beneath an igneous moon. This was allowed them in their exile, but one thing was forbidden. To engender life had been reserved unto the Lord of hosts, and the numbers of the alchemy of life had been hidden from the angels. Yet on the eve of the new war, the fallen under Lucifer had set their hands to the task of creation and tried to bring forth fresh invention, but so far below the Lord were they that they could not quicken any new thing, but only the dead. And they wedded dead flesh together with the souls of the damned and made both live again. And they took the fishes of the sea and river and the creatures of the mountain and woods and corrupted them, made them monstrous in size and quick to do harm. Because none of these could propagate save by killing, the devils set their hands to each one, working in secret until they made an arsenal of unclean flesh against the day they might release their bestiary into the world of men. That day had come. The vaults of the seas opened in the dark that was blacker than ink, and the devil's children snaked up into the rivers that veined between the cities of men. And the vaults of the mountains opened, and heinous things walked down the roads that bound the towns to one another, and great was the suffering of the seed of Adam. And the Lord made no answer. And still the war in heaven persisted, and neither could the wicked angels break through, nor those of God drive them down. So one of the fallen, whose name was Baal-zebuth, said, let us wear their greatest men like skins, and when they speak, they will speak our words. They will speak of wars and purgings and of dashing the babe's head. We will turn their understanding so they make their Christ a god of war, and we will cause them to set navies to the seas and armies under the moon with generals whose eyes glow like brands, and we will stir Turk and Christian alike to madness by our own deeds, and by our own hands will we hasten the death of men. And great was the noise of flies around him as he walked the earth, and Raum walked with him with his twelve eyes blazing, and Belphegor shook off his mane and walked in armor, received at the tables of wrathful men who knew him not. And the damned, who had deceived men as false prophets, rose again and lied. And the Lord made no answer. 20. Chapter 20. Of the Monk in White We have to build a raft. What? A raft. Build one or find one. Tomas looked at the girl. A brisk wind had just blown a shower of brown leaves on them, and one perfectly shaped maple leaf stippled red on its points, perched in Delphine's hair. Tomas removed it and chewed on the stem, trying to keep his balance in the pitching cart. The road, if it could be called a road after the rains had furrowed it, was quite rough here. He had found them near dawn. They had gone to town together but now they were in the cart again and moved south and east. His head throbbed from the blow it had sustained last night. He touched the egg above his eye, remembering how gently the girl had wiped the dried blood from it. He was drunk. 
The priest, bearing two black eyes from catching the girl, was worse, and the girl was not sober. Their tour through the ruins of Auxerre had yielded a cask of good wine. It had been the priest who spied it among the timbers and wattle of a fallen wine shop. It had not seemed wrong to him to take it, nor to ask the girl to help him roll it past the fallen buildings, past the dead penitents, all of them, it seemed. None of those zealots moved among the injured and dazed, though he saw one hand clutching a hooked whip, its owner obscured beneath stones. He had said mass again for the first time in months, giving last rites. He issued wafer, issued wine. The remaining Auxerrois had even helped hoist the barrel into his cart. They had seen the angel too. Even though catastrophe had visited them, the long months of death and suffering at last seemed to mean something. Good was fighting back. They knew the girl was blessed. As the cart pulled away, a woman had touched Delphine's sleeve with a hand as yellow as an onion skin, and its proper color had been restored, though Delphine had been unaware of this. And now this talk of a raft. Did you dream this, daughter? The priest said, <laughs> belching terribly at the end of it. His teeth were darker than his skin. No, I thought about it. The devil on the road said we would still be clip-clopping around at Christmas. I thought, too, about the wine. It is very good wine. It is, both men agreed. But what about the wine? Tomas asked. Oh, yes, they ship it on the river. It would take too long on a cart. Rivers are fast. Some rivers are fast. Well, they're all faster than a mule because they don't rest. The priest nodded, impressed. Agreed. Oh, Tomas. Agreed. But the Yon doesn't go to Avignon, Tomas said, spitting out his leaf. The Rhone does, said the priest. The girl filled her bowl again, drinking while the men spoke. Tomas took the spoon of ram's horn from his hat and chewed it punctuating his words by poking its gently gnawed end at Père Mathieu. What's the closest city on the Rhone? Lyon. That's far. Well, a river feeds it, though. I, I can't remember the name of that river. The name doesn't matter. What town sits on it? I'm not sure. You know wine. What wine comes from Burgundy? Burgundy? The priest said, blinking his bloodshot eyes. Don't be funny. Think. I'm too drunk to think. Then just say something. A, a wine town. In Burgundy. Quick. Uh, uh, Auxerre. Tomas winced, thinking about their exit across the Pont Roy Louis, where many of those fleeing the town had been hacked apart by something stronger than a man. We're drinking the last from Auxerre. Name another. Abois. No, that's Franche Comté, and it's straw colored. The river? No, the wine. It's from, uh, from Arbois. What's its river? I don't know. Name another! Bone. That's Burgundy, all right. But what's the river? I don't know. The conversation continued like that until the girl fell asleep. The priest got too drunk to guide the mule, and Tomas took the reins. Soon the road forked, and a sign stood by the right fork, which led into very pretty woods whose leaves were going soft yellow and startling red. Vesele mortis est. The priest was puking over the side, oblivious, trying vainly not to get any on his robes. Tomas had enough Latin for this one, though. Vesele is dead. We won't be going to Vesele, Tomas said though only the mule, who twitched an ear in his direction, seemed to hear him. Hope you weren't counting on finding a nice jenny-ass there, you grass-eating bastard. The mule made no reply. I hope you don't take this personally, but if we build a raft, you're not coming aboard, except in our bellies. Not the mule, the girl slurred, half asleep, half-heartedly striking Tomas with the back of her hand. The sound 
she said. What? The sound feeds the realm, she said dreamily. This road goes to Bone, another goes to chalon sur son Bone, sound, run. Bone, sound, run, Tomas repeated. Even I can remember that. But we'll steer around Bone. Why? Monsters there, she said, drawing her blanket around her head against the chill, and she slept. Père Mathieu woke in the abandoned grain loft he shared with Tomas and the girl, putting his hands immediately to his head, which was splitting. Tomas's snore, a deep bullish noise, shook the priest to his bones, and his mouth was so dry he thought it was full of nettles. The night was dark and cold. A stream. This loft was near a stream. He got to his feet stepped over the night, and eased himself past Delphine, who was also snoring, and louder than such a small creature should have been able to. He descended the rickety ladder. He pulled his robes aside, meaning to piss against a fence of sticks, but only groaned, unable to start. God, forgive my excess, he whispered, and I will try never to drink so very much again. Try is the word that trips you, brother. The priest fumbled his robes closed and looked for the source of the voice. A monk in Cistercian white stood near him, a silver-white ring of hair around his bald crown. I know, the priest said, you are right to point out my evasion. God has no love for half-measures. I believe you need water. Come with me. The priest stumbled through the brush behind this man, who seemed to radiate a calm strength he found irresistible. He wanted to cry. They came to the stream, and both of them bent and sipped water from their cupped hands. Are you with an abbey here? Père Mathieu asked, when both of them had slurped their fill. I have come home. Did your abbey succumb? All I served with are gone to their reward, and you? I do not think you are Burgundian. No, Norman. You follow a girl. Yes, a girl who is not what she seems. The priest chuckled fondly. Quite so. She seems to be from God. Père Mathieu lost his smile at the other man's implication. She is from God, I would stake my soul on it. And so you have. The priest stared at the old monk. Who are you? he said after a long moment. The monk put his hand over the priest's eyes and closed them as one might close a dead man's eyes. At that moment his headache left him and a great sense of ease filled him. The old man turned and walked away. Père Mathieu followed. When next the old man stopped, he sat down on the side of a hill, the grass and wildflowers of which rippled in the cold breeze. The priest sat next to him, and they both looked out across a dark countryside. One house on the side of a hill opposite had a fire in the hearth. Everywhere else was dark, save above them, where the stars blazed with a sad, desperate light that seemed to Mathieu and he cut like the gaze of a mother watching her child wrestle with a killing fever. A comet with a long, greenish tail chased two more near the constellation of the cart. "'What do you have against the girl?' asked the priest. "'You should rather ask why you trust her.' She has given me every reason to do so, and none to doubt her. Who was her father? A country lawyer. Or a heretic who fled justice in Languedoc. Père Mathieu rubbed his temples, even though they had long since stopped hurting. She stopped devils in Auxerre. Or brought them there? The priest shook his head and opened his mouth, closing it again. The weight of the old monk's stare yoked him, and he rubbed his neck. At length he said, 
she is good. We travel with a knight, a thief, a knight who has sinned, a knight who has been spat out by the church, a knight no longer. My point was, what was your point, brother? She is good. She loves, as Salome loved Herod. She always counsels peace when the wicked are near, for she protects them. She will tell the thief to kill when it suits her, but we are wasting time. Who are you? The old man got up and walked down the hill. He never looked back to see if the priest was following, and the priest almost did not follow him. Then he realized he was about to lose sight of him in the very dark night, and he would never find him again. So he got up and hurried after him. The old monk walked quickly now, so much so that the priest had to skip every third step to keep up. They crossed a low stone wall and walked past a living calf, something the priest had not seen for a long while. It was a white charolais, and it moved away casually, unconcerned with them. Its mother lowed nearby, as faint in the night as a diurnal moon, and it went to her. He stared after the wondrous creature so long he nearly lost his guide. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? The old Cistercian said as the priest drew near him. Pardon me? Are you prepared to see what God wants from you? The priest did not answer, but still followed him uphill now, across another wall and around a hedge. Now the window that shone across the hill glowed warm before them, and they approached a door. The old monk knocked, and a woman opened. She was plain and modest, more handsome than pretty, her hair bound in a clean wimple, her apron stained with sauce. The smell of wine-stewed beef rose up and made the priest's stomach rumble. He had put nothing in it since he had vacated his wine over the side of the cart that afternoon. Come in, she said, looking intimately upon the priest and taking his hand. Papa, a girl at the table said, bouncing excitedly on her bench. She was long-headed like him, like his brother. Papa, an even younger girl echoed, both of them ecstatic at the sight of him. Mama said you weren't coming. They were not saying Papa as in priest, but Papa as in father. It was like a bad joke. The priest looked for the monk, but he was gone. The woman took his chasuble and robe off, throwing them in the fire. Wait, you can't. The woman put her finger to her lips to silence him. She brought him a coarse wool overshirt and helped him on with it. She had uh, he had decided this was a dream and was now content to see where it led him. It was not unpleasant. Except that Mama said you almost went to hell because you were a bugger and that you were following a wicked little girl to commit murder. Is that true, Papa? Yes, dear he said, smiling at her. Well, I'm glad you're home, the other one said, smiling and showing the gap where a baby tooth had fallen out. I am too, the woman, wife, mother said, ladling out a rich spoonful of beef and onions and mushrooms on Mathieu's trencher. They all watched him. He ate, then they ate as well. A ripple of goose flesh went down his arm. Nothing had ever tasted so good. Now his wife brought wine. At first his stomach quivered at the thought of it, but then a sense of peace came over him. He was about to reach for it, but then the older girl spoke up. Papa, she said. His hand hovered near the cup. Yes. I want to live. Of course you do. We all do. But I can't. Why not? I can't be born unless you renounce your love of men. No, I suppose not. You're a very smart child. 
and quit being a priest. I was never a very good priest. And stop that girl. The room got just a little darker as smoke from his robes obscured the fire. He could smell them burning. Excuse me, he said. Delphine. She calls herself Delphine, but that's not her name. Did you say stop her? Both girls nodded now, and the elder spoke. Stop her with a rusty old sword between her eyes, or hold her head under water, or dash her brains out with a big stick. The younger one hit the table three times with her fist for emphasis, making the serving vessels rattle, then smiled. Because she's wicked, Papa. Her father was a Cathar, and she serves the devil, and she's going to commit murder. He looked down and reached for his wine, his brow furrowed. The old monk, who had reappeared at his side, grabbed his wrist before he took the cup and hauled him standing, hurting his shoulder. The monk <laughs> slapped him hard. The children started crying, but the monk made the same gesture in the air that he had made on the priest's eyes to banish his hangover. The girls stopped crying and sucked their thumbs like placid infants. The wife did as well. He hissed his next words at Matthieu Hanicut. Will you drink your wine before you agree to what is asked of you? God should be your comfort, but you have made comfort your God. What have you ever given up in his name except the promise of a wife and family you never wanted? How can you ask me to kill a girl? Killing in God's name is a holy thing. The room seemed to spin. Pick up that sword. What sword? The room and the hearth winked out into darkness, and when Père Mathieu's eyes adjusted, he was standing near the stream, struggling to start pissing. He managed. As relief came to him, he saw a sword, badly rusted, stuck in the bank of the stream. He finished, tucked himself away, and looked again at the sword. It repulsed him. Pick it up, sweet Mathieu, a voice behind him said, a gentle voice, a beautiful voice, and take it up the ladder. He turned now to see Michel Hébert standing nude and glorious before him, his feet in the stream, mud up to his shins, as when Mathieu last saw him nude under the burned bridge. The priest walked through the stream to him and put his face quite close to the boy's, trying to see if the freckle was still in his eye, the left eye. Go up the ladder and do what you have to. He could smell Michel's breath, somewhere between a young dog's breath and cloves. He could never get enough of that breath in his face. But the night will sleep through it. Michel, I... He tried to kiss the boy, but the boy smiled and moved his mouth away. Do it. We'll kiss, and more, when you get back. The priest took the sword out of the bank. He felt the end of it, and it was sharp. He took it to the base of the ladder. If this was a dream, he might do what was asked for in the dream, and dream a kiss from the only being for whom he had ever known carnal love. He was owed at least that, and perhaps more. He took the first step, and the second. At the third, his testicles turned to ice. The night will kill me. The fucking thief will fucking sleep. Now do it. He took another rung, and another, and he stood in the loft, looking down at the girl. None of this is real. He held the sword by the hilt, point down, one hand over the other, his knees bent like a man about to drive a stake into the ground. Quick, so it doesn't hurt. How can it hurt if it's not real? Should have wiped the mud off the end at least. The girl hiccuped in her sleep. He smiled despite himself, even his tears ran down his cheeks. The light was growing less faint. He saw one of his tears 
run down the runnel in the blade and perch at the point, swaying back and forth, threatening to drop on the child's nose. He lifted the point carefully, taking care to lift the drop until the sword pointed up and the drop ran back toward the hilt. He exhaled and came to himself. Good Lord, what am I doing? Miserable eunuch, do it now or die with them. He went back down the ladder. The boy was gone. The monk had returned, but there was something wrong with him. His eyes were mouths. They spoke in unison, while the mouth below his nose grinned like that of a father about to spank a richly deserving child. Too weak, were you? You'll have to give your gifts back. He took the sword from the priest's hand and threw it, so it spun end over end out of sight. I'll never hold a sword again. Then he grabbed the priest's face with a hand as cold and hard as a horseshoe and forced the first two fingers of the other hand into the priest's mouth and down his throat, making him gag. I thought you liked this, being penetrated. The fingers jammed in hard. Mathieu vomited the stew he had eaten. It came out his nose as well as his mouth and burned. And the monk was gone. Breathing hard, he went to rest his head on the mule's side, then climbed into the back of the cart. Before sleep took him, he saw the girl's eyes as she peered over the side of the cart at him. Her bare feet must have been on the hub of the wheel. What do you want? he asked. I had a bad dream, she said. Me too. What was yours about? St. Bernard of Clairvaux? She nodded, saying, his abbey was in Clairvaux, but he's from here, near here. She waited for him to ask. What happened in your dream, daughter? He made you kill me. The priest shuddered. Despite the cold air, he broke into a sweat. Why would he do that? I heard he was a very good man. My father said he condemned Abelard. He argued against the Cathars. He founded the Order of the Templars and told men God wanted them to kill for him. The priest's testicles, which had only just warmed up, went cold again. But surely a, a saint? He's not really a saint. No? She shook her head. Men made him a saint, not God. The priest said nothing. He's in hell. Oh, the priest said. Or he was. The girl blinked a couple of times, still looking at the priest. He would hurt me if he could. You wouldn't let him do that, would you? Hurt me? Not for all the world. He could tell by the way her eyes turned up that she was smiling. Not even for wine? He looked down and noticed that her robes, that his robes were still on. They had not burned, though they did smell like a hearth fire. A rooster crowed, and Delphine went back up the ladder, looking just a little less like a child. Chapter 21 Of Monsters and of Blessings Despite the wide berth they gave the city of Bone, they did see evidence of Delphine's monsters in the farmlands just south of the town. A tree in the middle of a field had all the leaves stripped from it, and now its branches hung with people and animals, all still as herrings, a fire twinkled at the base of the tree. They were being smoked. A heap of clothes lay nearby, as well as a separate pile of logs to feed the fire. A large, recently dug hole gaped in the side of a hillock, not far from the tree. The darkness of this hole was preternatural, seeming to push back against the daylight. 
It was big enough for a man on stilts to have entered without ducking. At the entrance to the hole was a scattering of feet. Whatever it was, it didn't like feet. Something moved in the darkness of the hole, and then they heard a sound that was somewhere between a rattling groan and an insect's buzz. The mule sped up his trot with no encouragement from his driver. That night and the next day brought them tremendous luck. The town of Shanyi had not admitted them, but three miles on they were able to find a functioning inn that was actually willing to rent them a room and use of a dry stable. The man who ran the inn was a former Franciscan monk who had left orders and taken a wife, the very same who now served them watery radish soup with some bitter green in it. Outside, near the well, a statue of the saint, covered in little stone birds, and well shat on by living ones, looked toward the gate. It was the innkeeper's avowed belief that the saint himself protected his house from plague, as well as from the things that had hammered their way into bone, and sometimes ranged as far south as Shanyi. Have you seen them? Tomas asked him. Yes, he said, in a very final way, looking down. He said no more about them. But one other guest shared the inn that night, a young merchant from Tuscany, who was on his way home from Paris on foot. His French was terrible, but the priest figured out from his badly grafted snatches of Franco-Italian that his wife had gotten a letter to him saying she was still alive. He took it out and cried over it and asked the priest to kiss it and to touch it with a rosary. He did. His translation of news from home gave them a taste of Florentine dark humor the mass graves with their layers of bodies lime and dirt had inspired less reverential tuscans to say the dead had gone to the lasagna rinaldo carbonelli had thick well-shaped eyebrows over his almond eyes and delphine found herself wishing she were the wife who had sent him his letter alive in italy with a handsome man walking home to her. She found herself looking at his hands as he spoke and wondering what those hands would feel like touching her hair. In her innocence, she imagined him petting her hair as if she were a kitten. She knew there was more after that. She had grown up on a farm, but she contented herself with letting her thoughts run to the edge of that cliff without looking over. Suffice it to say, that she would have very much liked for the Italian to pet her hair. Her gaze was so intense that the Tuscan caught her looking and smiled, indicating her to the others with a nod and a flick of his expressive eyes. Ragazza, he said, as if that explained everything, eliciting a chuckle from Tomas. You could come with us, the priest said at one point, as far as Avignon, at least. The Italian understood and nodded slowly, considering. The sparrow was fluttering in Delphine's chest now. She was enjoying herself so much, mooning over her new infatuation, that she wished it would go away, but it fluttered harder and harder until she spoke. Please don't come with us. The Italian understood that. Why, why you say these thing? She just stared at him. He laughed. What, you know, like my face? She answered him in rapid, perfect, Florentine Italian. Nobody else at the table could follow what the girl said, but his face went white, and he excused himself and went to bed. What did you tell him? The innkeeper asked, crossing himself. She looked deep into her empty soup bowl. I, I don't know. The Italian came with them as far as chalon sur saône walking beside the cart on his nimble young legs. He carried a bow and had six arrows left in his quiver, and soon after their departure agreed to accompany Tomas into a patch of woods to hunt. 
Tomas, stripping out of his armor near the cart, guessed from Rinaldo's gestures that he intended to shoot one arrow, and that he would not shoot a second for any reason whatever. If that was what he said, he proved himself a liar. They moved as silently as they could in the brown leaves, following a sort of path in the undergrowth that less experienced hunters than the Italian might have missed. To his eye, the broken twigs, missing leaves, and bent grass were as plain as a Roman highway. The trail led to a lush dip in the land where crabapple trees had been savaged for their fruit. The Italian pointed and winked at Tomas, splaying his fingers over his head to suggest horns, as if this gesture summoned them. Antler marks appeared on the bark of a chestnut tree with little bits of velvet adhering. This would be a good place. The men crouched upwind, Tomas's straw hat covered in branches, both of their faces darkened with mud. Tomas, having no bow, held his sword over his shoulders, knowing that his limited role encompassed only protecting Rinaldo, and if they were lucky, hauling back their prize. They were just about to give up, having been out for two hours or more, their fear of being caught at night too close to Bone and Chagny finally overcoming their hunger, when they saw the stag. It entered the woods before them at a kingly, slow walk, its coat the same reddish-brown as the carpet of leaves below it. Its antlers were magnificent, a trophy Tomas would have loved to set on his hearth in Picardy, though he knew he could never take such a prize as feeble as he was with the bow. Rinaldo drew his breath in and drew the fletching of the arrow halfway to his cheek. He would pull it all the way and release in the same motion as soon as the deer turned its side or back to them. He never got the chance, though. The deer heard something moving in the brush nearer to the two men and raised its head. Ten steps closer and Rinaldo would have loosed at its exposed chest, but at this distance he would have to shoot higher to account for the drop, and he didn't want to strike its head or clip its nose, wounding the magnificent thing for no reason. The noise came again, a crackling of leaves, louder this time. The deer left, not at a run, but too quickly for the Italian to adjust for both its motion and the saplings it crossed behind. He grimaced with his mouth open, his breath steaming out between his clenched teeth, still tracking the stag in case it turned, but it did not seem likely to do so. He felt Tomas's hand on his shoulder and reluctantly turned his head away from the disappearing red deer. Tomas was looking at him as if to say, Can you believe this? In a time of famine, when poaching laws were forgotten and men had all but emptied the woods of game, one magnificent trophy animal had been saved by a second. A wild boar snuffled in the brush, as yet unaware of the hunters. Por Troia, Rinaldo whispered, drawing the bow again and loosing. His arrow sank into the cheek of the wild boar, causing it to squeal and lash out in all directions with its tusked snout. He drew a second arrow, and that was when it locked its black little eyes on him and identified him as the source of its pain. It charged. He was glad now for the broad-shouldered Frenchman beside him, whom he had regarded as something of a hindrance on a deer hunt. This was a goddamned big boar. Rinaldo knew Tomas had stood up to a crouch and cocked his sword for a two-handed thrust, but he was too busy loosing a second arrow to see that Tomas was smiling like a little boy. And so it was that the four of them approached chalon sur saône with their bellies full, a blanket full of cooked meat in the cart, and in possession of the boar skin that would keep Rinaldo Carbonelli warm on his long trek over the mountains, since the girl had told him he would surely die if he came with them to the river.
he might have dismissed this warning had she not also told him that his wife katerina prayed for him each night looking out the window that gave on the arno that when she prayed she held between her clasped hands the little figurine of an angel he had carved for her from the bones of the stag he brought their father on the day he asked to marry her although rinaldo would never see the priest the girl or the knight again in this world he would bid them farewell on the banks of the saun as they embarked in the company of dangerous men his hard-won reunion with his Caterina would be celebrated in a public feast for which half the town would gather. The couple's embraces would inspire a local sculptor to carve an Apollo and Daphne, so beautiful that Apollo's fingers would be worn away with two centuries of women's kisses. Chapter 22 Of the Fishers of Men I told you to go to sleep, Tomas whispered to the priest. They stood in the front of the raft, watching the fat orange sun sink on their right. I can't sleep. I'm too agitated. How are you going to keep watch tonight? I don't know. For Christ's love, Father, Perhaps you should sleep and keep watch later. I should be awake when they are. Both men turned to look at the men on the rudders who were moving them back and forth with their strong brown arms to add a little speed. The younger of the two was missing an ear, a thief. The captain sat atop the cabin, eating salted herring and drinking beer from a goatskin. He was a lanky, untrustworthy, but highly intelligent fellow with perhaps the most decisively separated wall eyes Tomas had ever seen. While negotiating the outrageous price of passage with these river men, who were clearly more pirates than raftsmen, it had been difficult to figure out where the captain was resting his gaze. He had undoubtedly used this to his advantage in business as well as war, though here he was clearly not half the warrior his first mate was. The fourth man, the strong one, bent and cocked two more crossbows, his arms getting thicker as he uses muscles to work the windlass. He had the look of a wrestler, the kind who fought for small purses at county fairs, and won them. Once he had fitted the deadly iron-tipped bolts into their grooves and propped the bows against the cabin, he removed the bolts from the cocked ones and discharged them. Huh. Resting the cross piece, Tomas said. The man knew his weapons. Some of them will have to sleep. Yes, probably two while the others steer. I can watch all four of them at once. Can you? Better at day than I can at night. I don't see as well at night as I used to. Tomas threw up his hands and stepped over Delphine, who was sleeping soundly at their feet, using Tomas's leather satchel as a pillow. She had made it her practice to sleep or sit on the satchel whenever possible, as it contained their remaining gold and silver coins, as well as a handful of rings and necklaces left over from the spoils of Tomas's brigandage. The three of them would be in mortal danger if their hosts got a look in that bag, or if the men seemed to be guarding it. The captain came up to the front now, leaning on his pole. He spoke to them, for the first time since they came to terms at the docks. Tornus, he said, pointing his long spear at a cluster of houses over which the two towers of a church peered. Two men with cloths around their noses unloaded three women and a dead Benedictine monk into the water. One of these used a pole to push them out into the current. Greetings, friends, the captain shouted at them. Is it not a merry day to feed the fish? Merrier still, for you feed them a fisher of men. The carters looked up. 
one of them twitching his arm as though he thought to make a rude gesture, but reconsidered when he saw the blue fish on red strung over the cabin. This was the sigil of the guild of Simon Peter, the disarming name used by the ring of pirates that controlled the Saône all the way to Lyon. Merry enough, one shouted back submissively, and they turned their backs and wheeled their cart away. The bodies floated near the raft for a short way, as though trying to keep up. Sad bastard dolphins we have to play in our wake, the captain said, spittle flying from his lips. He turned to face his guests. Have you been to the sea? As it was not possible to tell which one he was looking at, both men said, No. Too bad, he said. You may have missed your chance. There's talk of the sea turning to gravel soon. Or was it glass? Or maybe it will just roll out and keep rolling and never come back. <laughs> but that's not all bad. I'd like to have a look at what's on the bottom. Maybe come back with a mermaid's ribs for a hat, eh? Neither man responded. Eh? He said more forcefully. As you say, said the priest. He nodded happily, satisfied. There was something weak in this man, Tomas thought. Something that needed to be told he was in charge, where stronger men just knew it. The one with the hammy arms would be captain soon if he wanted it. Maybe he was more like Tomas had been, though, happy to fight and take his share, until he was given the wrong order. Captain, one of the oarsmen said, that plaguey geezer's about to bump us. The captain turned his attention to where the monk floated on his back, as if at leisure, with his arms trailing beside him, his face, though waxy from the sickness, looked beautiful in the rippled orange water, the captain used his spear to push the dead man farther off. You would have liked to float with your arms outstretched like our lord, would you not? Float to glory like our lord? Maybe you weren't such a good monk as you thought. Go and ask St. Philibert and sad dolphin. Now he called back at the oarsmen. It is St. Philibert, that abbey. It is, the oarsmen said. It's important to know the names of things, he said. Tomas woke to the girl's fingers pinching his nose. He slapped her hand away and reached for the hilt of his sword, but she held a finger to her lips, then pointed. It was just dawn. The river seemed a mirror of itself from the night before, just the same rose-orange light in the sky and reflected on the water, only now the red ball of the sun was on their left. The rivermen were arming themselves. Tomas kicked the priest, who sat up quickly with fish scales on his cheek, so startled he broke wind. The raft was closing in on a larger vessel, a barge riding low in the water with its cargo of stone from the quarries near Tonus. A half dozen stout fellows stood watching the raft approach it. It was clear to Tomas that they didn't know whether they should arm themselves and provoke a fight. Oh no. Forgive me, I just lost my space. It was clear that to Tomas that they didn't know whether they should arm themselves to, and provoke a fight or allow themselves to be boarded. Their inaction made the decision for them. The captain came over to Tomas now, assaulting him with the oniony smell of his recently dyed yellow shirt, saying, You'll help us. I doubt it will come to blows, but stand with your sword ready as if you're one of us. Tomas stood, giving his friends a reassuring look. He didn't believe the bargeman had had the stomach for a fight. Still, he traded his straw hat for his chain hood and helmet. You know who we are, the captain shouted. Simon Peter's Guild, the captain of the other boat said. 
Where's your banner? The bargeman said nothing. How am I to know you've paid tribute if you don't fly the proper banner? I haven't paid. No worries, friend. You can pay now. So saying, he grabbed up a pole hook from the, bu from the bow and pulled the raft snug up against the barge. The two oarsmen held crossbows now, and the captain, Big Arms, and Tomas all stepped onto the other ship. The men suffered their boat to be completely looted, losing all their food, a cask of wine, and a small box of coins that the crew would later make impressed noises over, even though it was slightly less than Tomas and the priest together carried. All the while, Tomas stood at the ready, though he was embarrassed enough to be back at his old vocation that he didn't return the hateful glare of one of the young bargemen who seemed to be working himself up to act foolishly. Instead, the massive armored man with a scarred cheek and broken nose looked mildly at the boy and said, Don't. The boy didn't. Do we at least get our whoring banner so we don't get robbed by the next lot? The raft captain, taking up his long spear, said, But you haven't sold your stone yet. This was only half the necessary amount. You'll have to settle accounts with the next boat. But, as a personal favor, I will allow you to keep your cargo. You sure, captain? One of the oarsmen said, chuckling a bully's chuckle. <laughs> That's some really nice granite. I could build a hell of a bridge with granite like that. No, Thierry, fair is fair. Let them keep it. Thanks, the barge captain said. You're a real friend. The captain lost his wagging dog look, and his voice shed its false good humor. I'm a better friend than you know, you fat whoring slug. You've been very lucky today, and only because of my... Christian spirit, if you'd like to remember me at Mass, my name is Carolus. So saying, the wall-eyed pirate pushed off with a spear, leaving the granite barge to drift. The raft moved down the river without incident over the next days. The girl slept on the night's satchel by day and watched over Tomas and the priest when their sleeping hours overlapped all the way to Lyon, where the sound married the glacier-cooled Rhone and took its name. This was the biggest town on the river until Avignon, and the captain and both oarsmen were willing to take their chances with the plague to sample her remaining pleasures. Big arms stayed on the raft. Your old dice? the pirate asked Tomas. Every day I wake up in this world the same as you. Big Arms liked that, and took that as a yes, producing, a pig -knuckle, producing pig knuckle dice. The two soldiers gambled for small coins, Big Arms winning more often. When the others came, they bore bad news about the whores, but good news about the alehouse. They shared out generous bowlfuls of beer for everyone and joined in the dicing. The captain remarked, I like your priest. He doesn't waste his breath telling us what Christ would and wouldn't like. The priest looked down at his hands. Later, when the captain and the younger oarsman pissed over the side, and the other oarsman went to fetch an instrument, Big Arms leaned very close to Tomas. You were there, weren't you? Where? The man pointed at the pit in Tomas's cheek. He nodded. I was there, Big Arm said, French crossbowmen mixed in with the salamis. I've got one of those too, he said, pointing at the scar again, but I won't show you where. Tomas laughed. <laughs> they looked at each other for two heartbeats, then looked away. It occurred to Tomas that Big Arms hadn't brought up Crecy while the others were ashore, because he hadn't wanted to linger on that field too long. The man slapped Tomas on the back. There was nothing else to say about it. Now the older of the two oarsmen returned with his cornemuse and began to play it with some skill. 
The captain took off his leather shoes and beat time on the raft's dirty floor. And soon the other oarsmen and big arms started dancing. Tomas joined them, imitating their raftsman's dance, which involved a lot of heel stamping and sliding of the feet on the gritty boards, all done with the hands on the hips or linking arms. They called for the priest. We've only... We're, uh, we're, we're only supposed to dance at Christmas and the feasts of St. Nicholas and Catherine. Père Mathieu did sing, though, when the piper left his raftsman's dances and played a Norman harvest song. The girls sang, too, joining in on the second verse. For soon the winter's breath shall breathe the summer's greens away, oh. But what care we with bread enough and instruments to play, oh. Jean will cut us sheaves of wheat, and his two sons will bind them, while his daughters hide away where none of us can find them. Swing, ho, swing your scythe, for God is in his heaven. And if we do not work, he will not give us bread to leaven. Swing, ho, swing your scythe, for Mother Mary loves you. And as you sing your working song, she sings along above you. For the first time, Tomas allowed himself to think they just might get to Avignon, and that whatever the girl had come to do might just get done. The raftsmen boarded two more vessels in the next three days, one a fishing boat manned by two frightened teenagers, both missing fingers, and their one-handed father, who surrendered their astonishing catch of pike without incident. The other was a shallow-hulled sailing boat that tried to run. Brig big arms cranked the windlass while the younger oarsman and the captain shot bolt after bolt into the ship. A man with a party-colored cowl took a quarrel in the hip, and he howled lamentably while the other two fought over the limited shelter provided by a wooden chest aft, one getting his scalp grazed so he bled awfully, though the wound was not serious. Neither bothered about the rudder, and the quick little boat ran aground in a bend at the river just as the distance was getting too great for real accuracy. Big Arms and the younger oarsmen searched the boat, the latter pitching the man with a hip wound into the shallows to stop his caterwauling. He managed to scramble onto the bank and limp away in great loping spasms that made the captain <laughs> laugh girlishly from where he sat his supervisory post cross-legged atop the cabin. He laughed harder yet when the man collapsed in a field of rotten squash. The take was unimpressive. A few coins, a small drum, some extra clothes, and three finches in wooden cages. The oarsman put his foot exactly next to the foot of the wounded man and then made him remove his leather shoes. You idiots fled to save this shit, he said, trading shoes, handing the hurt man his worn-out slippers. The other man, a paunchy youth with soft hands, said, We did not wish to be harmed for our poverty. We were going to Avignon to seek work at the court of his holiness. The man you pitched over is a great jester. Well, he sure runs funny. The oarsman presented the cages to the captain who had leapt down from the cabin. He reached inside a cage, caught the panicked bird with some difficulty, and wrung its neck, throwing it at soft hands. He was reaching for another cage when Delphine ran forward, just escaping the grasp of the priest who tried to stop her. She wrapped her arms around the cage and sat down, putting her hand over the door. The oarsman tried to yank the cage away, but she held tight, letting him jerk her halfway to her feet. The captain instinctively drew back to strike her, but checked himself, sensing that Tomas had taken a step in his direction also having noted that Big Arms was still on the other boat. He changed what would have been a vicious backhand into a tousling of her hair, at which she grimaced, clutching the cage more tightly. Let her have the birds, the wall-eyed man said, proud of his spontaneous magnanimity. Her papa has been useful. We thank you, the priest said, as Delphine sat the cages down and opened their doors, 
taking one docile bird and then the other into her hands, she kissed them both, then released them. One flew up into the sky, the other went toward the bank. The captain turned his head toward Tomas. Happy, he said. Tomas pulled Delphine behind him. So happy I could shit, he said, sheathing his sword. Big arms got back on the raft. The uninjured man tended his friend's scalp. Nobody saw a second finch. Nobody, excuse me, nobody saw the second finch fly into the squash field where it stayed for a moment before flying up again and into the clouds. Neither did they see the jester now get to his feet and run toward a farmhouse in the distance, no longer limping. Big Arms, whose Christian name was Guillaume, had argued against it, but now it was happening. The captain, seeing that the foolish priest was sleepy, had given him unwatered wine to put him under so he might peek at what the passengers were carrying. Once the priest was asleep, the captain had looked into the night's satchel even as the girl slept on it, and the sight of gold had maddened him. He took a chain and a few coins without waking her, but more lurked under her head. He called the others to the rear of the raft and told them the time had come to bid their passengers farewell. Guillaume and the other Guillaume and the older oarsman wanted none of it. The oarsman was fine with piracy, but felt that harming paying passengers was a kind of oath breaking. Guillaume, for his part, felt a deeper loyalty to the knight who had also faced the English at Crecy en Pontieu than he now did to his captain, whose arrogance and madness were worsening by the day. He said it went against his conscience to rob their guests, who had been good and useful companions. The captain had said, The guild knows its own, and has no loyalty to any other. It also saw fit to make me captain of this raft, and master of you, even unto your life. We send them from this wicked world, and take upon ourselves the guilt of their wealth. That is my command. Guillaume nodded his assent but asked that the girl should be spared and brought to Avignon if she would go with them after. The captain had agreed, but Guillaume knew he was lying. And now it had begun. The oarsmen had their daggers out and were creeping toward Tomas as if toward a sleeping bear. The captain, holding a brutal, rusty falchion, was on his way to dispatch the priest where he snored, sitting up near his empty wine bowl, the stars were very bright above them, and the run was creeping slowly, lulling with its mutter, leaving the raft a steady platform for murder. Guillaume had his crossbow at the ready, and two others at his feet. If the knight stirred, he was to shoot him. The oarsman's knife was almost at the knight's throat. Guillaume only knew he was going to do it, a heart beat before he did. The thought came to him and seemed so clear and correct that his fingers squeezed the lever almost on their own. He shot the oarsman. The man made a small ah, gagging sound and jerked, reaching for the quarrel in his back. He dropped his dagger pommel first and the sound woke Tomas. The younger oarsman looked back at Guillaume with wide, betrayed eyes, and at that moment Guillaume's sight went black as the captain's falchion struck him on the crown, and he fell. Tomas had been dreaming of his wife. She was crying, pounding the heel of her hand against the table and shaking with something between remorse and outrage, it seemed wrong that her small hand had made such a loud noise on the table, a noise like dropped metal, and Tomas opened his eyes to see two men standing over him, one of them twisting, grabbing at his own back, the other turning now to look behind him. Farther down the raft, big arms went to his knees, and the figure that had struck him moved toward Tomas. 
He scooted forward on his butt and kicked the feet out from under the confused oarsman, while the wounded one managed to touch the feathered part of the quarrel in him, the pain making him vomit all over himself. He fell suddenly, then lay still. Tomas just had time to get to his feet, taking a slash from the falchion that numbed his mailed forearm, and then kicked the captain in the hip to push him back. He used his still-sheathed sword to slap the younger oarsman across the head, knocking him down. Then he drew his weapon. The girl was awake now, howling, Stop! Stop! at the brawling men, shaking the priest to wake him. The captain sprang back, sheathed his falchion, and grabbed up his long spear. Don't kill him! the girl yelled. I won't if he jumps over! Tomas answered. Guillaume fell on his stomach, but then struggled up on all fours, <sighs> panting like a dog, trying to make sense of the chaos around him and of the blood pooling under his face. The younger oarsman, also stunned, shook his head clear and dashed between Tomas and the captain. He grabbed the girl by the hair now and exposed her throat. The priest tried to grab his arm, but was viciously elbowed in the nose and fell backward. Drop the sword or I'll open her, the oarsman said. Don't kill them, please, the girl yelled as if she were not the one closer to death. Her hands were on the man's knife arm, but they were little more than a cat's paws would have been. Then she shut her eyes because she felt the oarsman's arms tense and knew he was about to cut her throat. Except that he didn't. Big-armed Guillaume, blinking blood out of his eyes, had crawled over now and held the oarsman's arms from the outside, pulling them apart as slowly and irresistibly as a starfish opening a clam, clutching as hard as he could and hoping his blood-slick hands kept their grip. If he slipped, the other man's knife would all but cut the girl's head off. Don't! she yelled again now, still at Tomas, who was coming at the captain, ducking his spear slashes laterally, but unable to get inside because the other man circled so quickly. Guillaume had the oarsman spread-armed now, and the priest hit him in the face with his wooden bowl so hard he broke the bowl. The oarsman dropped his knife. Guillaume let the man's arms go, then heaved him over the side, passing out as he did so, so that one arm trailed in the cold water. The girl got to her feet, as did the priest, and she stood behind him, wanting to jump between <coughs> Tomas and the captain, but knowing the captain would kill her. Drop that whoring thing and jump if you want to live, Tomas told the wall-eyed man. I don't need to live, the captain said. I've already seen the sea. And keeping his gaze deceptively on Tomas, he lashed out sideways with his spear, just missed the priest whom he would have impaled. The girl cried out in a startled squeak. Tomas attacked the spear rather than the man now, driving it down with his sword and stepping through it, breaking off the first third. The captain, not missing a beat, whipped the remaining part of his shaft around and caught Tomas a glancing blow on the shoulder that also struck his head rattling him even through his chain hood, but it wasn't enough. Tomas cut the man's arm off just below the elbow. The captain looked stupidly at where it lay and bent to pick it up with the remaining one. Tomas! the girl yelled at him. Tomas! She meant to make him spare the beaten man, as if his life could still be saved at all, but her words had the opposite effect. The captain's jab at the priest had clipped her below the mouth, not much, but enough to beard her chin in blood. When Tomas saw that the girl was cut, he breathed out like a bull, <sighs> grabbed the dazed captain's hair, yanked his head back and cut his throat with a long-notched blade. He took his time about it. The girl screamed, No! And then she just said, No! And she let the priest take her in his arms, even though the tears she thought herself about to shed 
didn't come. The captain fell, so his head lolled back, and his open throat bled into the liver. Tomas watched this for a moment, then wiped his sword. I told you not to, the girl said, but her face betrayed her relief that the hurtful man was gone. We're going to pay for that, she said. I'm ready, said Tomas. I'm not, she said, and looked at the water. Tomas rolled the captain's limp body off the raft, and it sank as if pulled down. A fucking hand. The raft drifted sideways and into darkness. When the sky got light enough for the work that had to be done, Guillaume bowed his head and let Tomas stitch him. Tomas had sat with Guillaume through the last hours of darkness, holding the captain's extra shirt to the wound as the big man shivered and swore the bone needle and twine had also come from the captain's trunk. Guillaume was strong, and he lived for a time.